Good morning, Mount Calvary. It is a, a great day to come in, uh, to the presence of our Lord uh, as He has called us here to worship Him, uh, to know Him more, to love Him more, to delight in who He is. Um, I'm uh, very glad to be here. I'm very glad that you're here with us. If you are a visitor, we uh, welcome you especially. Um, there are visitor cards in uh, the back of the pews. If you would um, fill those out, that would be wonderful. That way we can know how to minister to you. Uh, I do have a few announcements. First of all, um, pastors, uh, Pastor Richard's leadership development class is beginning real soon. So if you are interested in signing up for that, um, please do that um, by getting in contact with him, um, and please do that uh, soon if you are able. As well, this evening uh, at 6.30 p.m., uh, rehearsals for children's Christmas program begin. So the, the children will be with us um, as we um, enter into worship, as we sing, um, and then they will be dismissed um, to rehearse for the, the Christmas program. Um, this Wednesday, of course, we're gathered again to do youth group, catechism, and prayer meeting. Um, again, it's a great midweek um, study where we can focus on our Lord and our God and our Savior. Um, and you don't even have to make food. Um, so please do RSVP. Uh, that's very helpful for us um, for the meal on Wednesday. Next Sunday, uh, the 19th, we have our ice cream fellowship um, and service focused on prayer. And at that point, we will be um, uh, posting those uh, cards for pray praying for uh, our students and teachers and administrators. So we encourage you. Uh, to come for that. And then spur groups begin today. Um, so all middle schoolers, high schoolers, uh, I encourage you to come back to church at 5 p.m. this Sunday. We'll have a meal um, and the leaders are, are ready, excited um, to have a great year of uh, growing on in Jesus Christ, um, hearing for him, uh, praying together, growing in fellowship and in our faith. And then as well, uh, our alongside study uh, begins this Tuesday for parents of teenagers who um, would like to, to grow and being able to uh, walk alongside our teenagers with the gospel and show them the gospel. A couple of prayer request updates. Uh, Lewis Harrison is home from the hospital, so um, praise the Lord for that. Um, but he's still very weak. Um, so please continue to pray for him uh, that he'd be strengthened. And then Heidi Blake um, is a 29-year-old granddaughter of Terry Bennett. Um, she is still um, at regional and has COVID pneumonia. She's not in the ICU um, um, but she is uh, in the hospital in the COVID uh, unit, and she's wearing an um, oxygen mask right now. Um, so she's not on the ventilator, but she does have an oxygen mask. So please continue to uh, pray for her as well. With those announcements, our call to worship comes from Psalm 22, verses 22 through 27. And here in this psalm, um, David is responding to the Lord's great deliverance. Uh, David felt abandoned by God. He was surrounded by all those who hated him. He was close to death. And yet David trusts. And uh, the Lord brings a wonderful salvation. And of course, this points us to uh, Jesus, ultimately, uh, who is afflicted and yet victorious. And this psalm points us now, as we see that great deliverance, this is how we should respond. This is how God's people should respond, as we see Jesus' great deliverance. So this is our... A response of praise and thanksgiving. Psalm 22, verses 22 through 26. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Let's pray. Lord God, you are so great, so worthy of all of our praise. And Lord, we come to you this morning remembering especially the salvation, the rescue that you have purchased for us by sending your son. Lord, your son who was afflicted and hated, surrounded by the evildoers, Lord, murdered on the cross. And Lord, again this morning we come... 
Lord, in order to see you, in order to see what you've done for your people. Lord, help us delight in you. Help us to seek you. Help us to fear you. Help us to love you more. And let our remembrance, Lord, let our uh, remembering what you've done for us and who you've made us into be, Lord, help that to well up in us. Lord, and help, help us to then pour out praise. Lord, help us then to glorify you because of the mighty things that you have done for us. Lord, and we praise you even as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you read through the Psalms, you'll see uh, the headings under Psalm 22, as we read for our uh, call to worship, it would say, uh, to the chief musician set to this tune, and some say of David or of Asaph. Uh, the one that we're going to sing now this morning is Psalm 92, and it says simply, a song for the Sabbath day. And uh, we're going to sing it to the tune of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. So let's stand together and sing the words of God. It is good to sing your praises. on uh, of religious worship and the sabbath day it comes to us from the westminster confession of faith chapter 22 paragraphs 7 and 8 please read this uh, in unison as it is is of the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of god so in his word by a positive moral and perpetual commandment binding all men in all ages he hath particularly appointed one day in seven for a sabbath to be kept holy unto him which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of christ was the last day of the week and from the resurrection of christ was changed into the first of the week, which in scripture is called the Lord's Day, and is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. This Sabbath is then kept holy unto the Lord, when men 
after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering of their common affairs beforehand, do not only observe a holy rest all the day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employments and recreations, but also are taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and mercy. tithes and offerings. We will pray uh, for those, um, and then we will sing the doxology. Let's pray to the Lord, thanking him for all that he has given us. Lord God, we thank you that as we come to worship you every Sabbath day, that there's a time and a portion of worship that is set apart for giving back. Lord, you have done a wonderful thing. You've done a miraculous thing. You've done a gracious thing, and giving us life, joy, peace, by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, securing us in your family for eternity. Lord, in a part of that thanksgiving and a part of our response is to give back, just a small portion. So Lord, I pray that these gifts would be um, used for your honor and glory, that your name would be spread, and I pray that you would bless the giver as well. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go uh, to the Lord in a prayer uh, for God's people. Let's pray. Lord God, again, we, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you that you hear us. Lord, as we heard from Psalm 22, Lord, we thank you that you don't despise us. Lord, that you don't hide your face from us when we come to you. Lord, you hold the entire world in your hands. Lord, you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins. You are God, and yet you care. You care even for the small things, and we thank you for that. Lord, this morning we, we pray especially for the ministries at Mount Calvary. Lord, some ministries that have been continuing um, throughout the summer, some that have begun recently, Lord, and some that are beginning even today. Lord, we pray for Sunday school. Lord, we thank you so much for the teachers. Lord, for their commitment, for their willingness to spend time and energy in order to teach the youth of this congregation, that they might know, that they might see Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the students. Lord, that this time would be time where they can grow, where they can, um, as it is fitting on the Sabbath day, to hear of you to know you more, to love you more. Lord, we pray for spur groups. Lord, we thank you that uh, this wonderful ministry gets to be kicked off this evening. Lord, we, I pray that you, again, would be with the leaders. Give them wisdom. 
Help them to understand uh, the youth. Help them to be able to pray with the youth. Help them to be able to um, have wisdom and joy as they minister the gospel to the youth. Lord, we pray for the, the children's Christmas rehearsal that, that begins uh, today as well. Lord, we pray that that would be a joyful time for our children. Lord, we thank you for those who are uh, involved in that. And we pray that that would be uh, just a wonderful time of singing praises to you. Lord, we also pray for our Wednesday night activities. Lord, help us to have a great fellowship over the meal uh, every Wednesday night. Lord, we know that you delight uh, when your people come together as a community in fellowship. Lord, just come and care about one another and talk to one another and ask one another about their week. Ask one another how we could pray for them. Ask one another what the Lord is doing in their lives. Lord, we pray that that time of fellowship uh, would be used and that it would be a, a great delight. Lord, we pray for the prayer meeting. Lord, help us to be a congregation that loves prayer. Lord, you delight to hear from us and you call us to be prayerful. So, Lord, I pray that we would be devoted to coming to you, Lord, in, in our need and in thanksgiving and in praise. Lord, I pray for catechism as well. Lord, the teachers, again, do, do such, um, spend so much time uh, preparing to teach our children about Jesus Christ and about what you've done. Lord, that's what you've called us to do. So, Lord, I pray that there would be much fruit. Uh, the children would know um, who their God is and who Jesus is and what he has done for his people. Lord, I pray for the youth as well, Lord, on Wednesday nights. Help, help the middle schoolers and the high schoolers to be drawn closer to you, to delight in you. Lord, help me as I teach them and that uh, they might see Jesus Christ in new ways. Lord, that they might know your love for them and your care and your call upon their lives to, to believe in you. Lord, I pray for the alongside study that, that's beginning this Tuesday. Lord, I pray that the parents would um, be able to grow and to be able to be excited about loving our teenagers with the gospel. Lord, help this to be a great time of encouragement and of reflection and of growth. Lord, I pray for pastors' leadership development class. Lord, I pray that you would be raising up leaders within this church um, to lead. Lord, that, that is a necessary part of the church. Lord, that there are leaders in a special um, place within your church. Lord, but not only leaders in your church, but in families and in the workplace. Lord, I pray that that would be a wonderful time, Lord. Uh, you call us to disciple. And I pray that pastors would be able to do that effectively in that class. Lord, we even pray for the ice cream social next Sunday, Lord, with the back-to-school prayer aspects as well. Lord, we thank you um, uh, for uh, these people, for this church. I pray that that would be an exciting time of fellowship and of prayer as well. Lord, I thank you for all the ministries going on. I pray that they would be effective, uh, that your name would be honored and glorified. I pray that you'd be with the leaders, that you'd equip, that you'd save, and that you'd encourage this year. Lord God, I also pray for the Hatchet family. Lord, I pray that you would be with them in a special way. Lord, that in this time they would feel your special felt presence. That you would be near to them. Lord, that you'd hold them. That you'd give them great peace. Lord, I pray for Lewis Harrison. I praise you, Lord, that he is back from the hospital. We thank you for that good news. But Lord, we continue to pray. Lord, as he is very weak, Lord, we pray that you would give him strength and that you'd heal him. Lord, we pray for Heidi Blake as well, that 29-year-old granddaughter of Terry Bennett, uh, who's at regional with COVID. Lord, I pray that you'd please be with her. Give her healing. Please be with the family as well. Give them courage and comfort. Lord, I pray that you would please be with Heidi. Lord, we also pray for Marla Jeanette, Naomi's friend, Lord, and, and Danny, who's very close to passing from COVID. Lord, we pray for Marla, Lord, as she has terminal cancer and expects to be uh, the only parent of uh, six teenagers and a one-year-old very soon. Lord, they need you. 
They need your salvation. They need to know Jesus Christ. But Lord, they also need help. So Lord, I pray that that the uh, sparks would be able to minister well to them. But Lord, I pray that we as a church would be able to minister to them as well. To be able to show them your grace and your care and your love for people who, who need you and who seek you. Lord, you're so good. We thank you. And we put all of these prayers before you. We thank you that you hear us. We pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Three and four year olds are dismissed at this time to go to Children's Church. Let's all stand together now and sing On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. copy of God's word at John chapter 5. John chapter 5 as we come back to this uh, wonderful gospel where we continually see these wonderful snapshots from the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to bring our attention this morning to John chapter 5 at verse 9. Now it's kind of picking up in the middle of uh, a story uh, that takes place during the Lord's life. So I want to bring you up to speed and kind of tell you what happens from the beginning of chapter 5. Uh, and of course, you'll be familiar with this because we preached through it recently. The Lord Jesus, of course, comes to Jerusalem. And uh, you can imagine that in his heart, he, he is going straight to this pool at Bethesda. And he makes his way to the pool and around this pool where there are these five porches are this great multitude of the sick, the blind and the lame. And the paralyzed, people who are waiting for the stirring of the water, waiting to be able to get in the water after the waters have been stirred so that they can be healed. And he weaves his way through this multitude of people. Uh, you, you, You picture hundreds, I suppose. And he goes to this one person who's been afflicted with what appears to be lameness. 
an inability to get in the pool is revealed in the text. And he's been afflicted so for 38 years. And he walks to him and he says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? And of course, this man's focus is completely on, well, I have no one to put me in the water. And before I can actually get in the water and be the first person in there, somebody else gets in the water. And then the Lord Jesus simply says to him, rise, (laughs) take up your bed and walk. And like this, with those words, he's healed. And with faith that we believe is given to him by God. He doesn't say, well, I've not been able to walk in 38 years. Why would I even try to stand up? But he does. And he takes up his bed and walks. What an incredible healing. What an incredible manifestation of the glory and the power of our great Savior. And we're supposed to see that. But that's not all that happens in this particular scene. And so that brings us to the reading of our text this morning. I want you to pick this up with me in the middle of verse 9. You'll see it kind of breaks there. And there's a, uh, in many of our Bibles, there's a paragraph break uh, in the middle. And so it picks up there in verse 9 in the second half. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews, therefore, said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And then he asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. And afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. And therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making him equal with God. And thus ends the reading of God's word this morning, and may he be pleased to bless it to our hearts that it would fill our hearts and cause us to be conformed to the image of his son. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we know that this is not merely uh, a snapshot of our Savior's life, but it is the living, active Word of God that is sharp to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And we're grateful for that, that we stand before your Word in the hands of your Holy Spirit. And we ask that you would come and do a great work in us this morning, that you would open our hearts, that you would make us like unto Jesus. Lord, our prayer is, is that we would see Jesus. Would you help us now? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to look at verse 11. Here, uh, it, it said that he answered them, the one who had been healed. He said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed. They had just asked him, who is this who said, take up your bed? And, and immediately in verse 11, he said, hey, the guy who healed me said to take up my bed and walk. Now, it's interesting. Some commentators say it was like the guy was trying to, to put all the pressure, all the blame, if you will, for carrying the bed on Jesus. I don't think that's what he's doing. I think rather what he's doing in verse 11 is simply saying that the one who has the power to heal an organic problem, an organic disease that I've been dealing with for 38 years, he's the one who told me to take up my bed and walk. And who else would have the authority to do that? The person who can do that, he, can, he would tell me anything and I would be happy to do it. I think that that's his heart, that he's, he's actually glorying in this person. He can't even, at this point, name his name. But I want you to see that as Jesus has brought about the healing and they finally track him down, the, the, the man who had been healed finally identifies 
the, the healer as the Lord Jesus, and he tells the Jews, and then the Jews come after him, and the text says here in verse 16 that the Jews persecuted Jesus. Now, we don't have an idea as to what the nature of that persecution was, if that was merely verbal or if that got physical or what, we don't know. But they began, even at this point, to persecute Jesus. And by the way, this is where the fork in the road is for the Lord Jesus. It's at this point that life begins to get very difficult for him in his uh, public ministry. But the persecution begins. And why? I want you to notice the, the intention of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to go... I think the Holy Spirit is going out of his way to say to us through the pen of John that this all began because of Jesus' work on the Sabbath. He goes out of his way to note that it's the Sabbath. Look at the text. In verse 9, it's mentioned that it was the Sabbath. And that day was the Sabbath. In verse 10, the same thing. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. You can't do this on the Sabbath. Verse 16, it's mentioned again, this, this idea of the Sabbath. They persecuted him. They sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Verse 18, again, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because... He not only broke the Sabbath, but uh, also said that God was his father. There's this focus upon the Sabbath here. And why does the Holy Spirit do that? Why does the Holy Spirit call our attention to that? Because it does seem that he's saying, hey, I want you to notice what's going on here. Now, he takes a situation where the Jews of this particular day are abusing the Sabbath directives that come from the Scripture. So let's back up just a little bit. We know that if we go back to the law, if we go back to the Ten Commandments, if we go back to Exodus chapter 20, that we're told there um, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, and six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that it's a day given by the moral law, a, a day given to worship um, and rest from our worldly employments. In recreations. Now, down through the years, God's people had violated this law. And God had warned them. In fact, he said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to discipline you if you continue to violate the Sabbath. Let me give you just two examples. We won't take long on this, but I want to give you two examples from this. One is from the book of Jeremiah. It's in chapter 17. I'll read these to you. Jeremiah 17, verse 21. Listen to this. And the Lord says... Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it into the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. Verse 27 there in Jeremiah 17 goes on and says this, But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden, you see the emphasis on carrying a burden here, when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates. Here comes the discipline of the Lord, or the threat of discipline. And it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. You get the idea. One more example, and it's from Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13, and verse 15. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing sheaves and loading donkeys with wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. You get the idea. But the point here is, is that the Lord is saying, look, through the carrying of burdens, you're ending up doing business on the Sabbath day. And that's a violation. I've given you this day as a blessing to you. And you're abusing it to your own harm. Don't do this. Now, <clears throat> what happens by the time we get to the Lord's day? Well, what happens is, is that these Jewish followers have added human accretions, layer by layer, of extra things that they had put uh, on there. To the point that when a man is healed of 38 years of lameness and he takes up his bed. Oh, you can't do this. And they rebuke him because he is 
carrying a burden. Now, he's not doing business. He's probably rejoicing in the Lord for this incredible change in his life. Now, we, we've heard all kinds of stories down through the years as to how these uh, Jewish folk have, had added just crazy things to their understanding of the law. They were not God's word. They were human additions. I'll, I'll give you one that, that's kind of funny. Um, someone wanted to carry a handkerchief from upstairs to downstairs, but to carry a handkerchief, in their opinion, was a burden. So they couldn't carry it downstairs on the Sabbath day. Unless you made that article an article of clothing. Now, if you tied the handkerchief around your neck, then you could start from upstairs, walk downstairs, take it off your neck, hold it up, put it in the drawer downstairs. Crazy stuff to try to um, keep the law. And these are in existence by the hundreds. Let me say that the Lord Jesus hated those human additions. He loved the law. The law was good. And he loved the law. But he hated these things. And he hated the fact that the true meaning of the Sabbath was missed. They missed the glory and the wonder and the grace of the Sabbath day. Now, let me make a point here before uh, we move on. We said in our affirmation of faith this morning that we, we don't observe the Sabbath. We observe a Christian Sabbath. And what we affirmed was, and we believe that this is uh, firmly established upon the foundation of the Scriptures, is that we observe a Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day now, Sunday instead of Saturday. Sunday instead of Saturday. <clears throat> and while the Sabbath rest started as God's gift and protection of his people against erosion into, into paganism. And paganism in the sense of life without God at its center. In other words, we're going to come and, and, and this day is going to become just like any other day in terms of the business that we will conduct and people began to practice it with more of a focus on the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. And what was happening? Well, there was outward conformity without heart commitment. There was outward conformity to the law without this heart commitment. Commitment to the Lord, con commitment to his love and to, to his revelation of his glory and his wonder through the Sabbath day. Now, it's an easy thing for us to condemn those Jewish people who added all those extra layers of human understanding to the law. It's easy for us to condemn them. But I wonder about us in our day. Do we often do the same thing where there may be outward conformity with no heart commitment on our part? Or, perhaps even worse, do we even think about the Christian Sabbath or the Lord's Day as a day that's different, a day that God has given us as a day of worship, a day where, we, where he's, <clears throat> he's given us the freedom to rest from all those things that vie for our attention and our energies and our thoughts. And so that we can simply... Meditate upon him and his greatness. <clears throat> I wonder if these Jews here in John chapter 5 reflect our hearts sometimes. When we lose sight of the ultimate purpose of, of this Sabbath rest for us. And, and what is that ultimate purpose for us? Well, it, it's about, it reminds us that we're to have lives that model uh, uh, God's call upon us, it, uh, uh, modeling a life that pleases the Lord. Lord, my whole life is yours. All seven days are yours. And I want to model a life that pleases you and is a witness and a testimony to your gracious choice, not just of a nation, the nation of Israel, but your gracious choice of me. Think about this. We said this a couple of weeks ago. Jesus, of all those 
with at least scores, maybe hundreds of people around this pool, he comes and he finds this person. And he, re he relieves him of years, years of this horrible affliction. And likewise, what he has done for us through his sinless life and his death on the cross and through his resurrection as commemorated on the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath today, as he has come and he has rescued those of us who have repented and believed on Jesus Christ. Don't you look forward to the Lord's Day to say, I look forward to that day when I can say, Lord, especially today, I testify to you and your rescuing power in my life. Don't you do that? Don't you anticipate this day and say, there's, there's no other day when, when the 200 of us can gather together in this room and sing and hear the word and pray together corporately? What an incredible gift to us. For these Jews, here in John chapter 5, the law became an end in itself. And when the Jews confront the man, the total focus of what they were confronting him about was on this supposed violation of the law. With no thought of the incredible, unimaginable healing that had, gone, uh, that had taken place, that had gone down. But do we do the same thing sometimes and we completely forget? We, we don't even remember that day when we were in such bondage to sin. I, I recently read a book. I read it last weekend. One of our members put it in my hand. It's a book. Uh, it's called Gringo Mamo. It's an interesting title, isn't it? It's about a man who at two years old was taken by his missionary parents to the jungles of Venezuela. And, and all of the incredible things that are going on uh, through their ministry over the years. This man's now uh, uh, probably in his 60s, close to 70 years old. And he tells this story very quickly about the conversion of a man named Bautista. And Bautista uh, is someone who would labor with these missionaries for, uh, for decades with them, faithfully walking with them. And finally, towards the end of their uh, living and working together, uh, the man who wrote the book, his name is Gary, asked Bautista, why is it that you are so different from so many of the other people in this tribe among whom they were working? Why is it that you're so different? Why is it that you have remained so faithful? And without going to great length, he basically says that I was in such bondage to the demonic world. He was a former shaman. And, and God freed me from so much. And I so clearly remember the kind of bondage that I was in and the despair and the hopelessness that was going on. And Jesus came into my life and he freed me from all of that. And there were plenty of addictions, addictions of the heart, uh, even among these uh, very primitive uh, tribes people and that's what has caused me to continue to walk with Jesus and to walk with such fervor and such love for him and I thought about that book and I said you know that that is so needful in our day today because I think so often what happens to us is we go through not just a day, but a week, and blow through our Christian Sabbath, and we have not a thought for the incredible rescue that you are. Can I get an amen? The, the, the being lifted from the miry clay and, and, and set on a solid rock. But many of us, if we said, well, where would you be today without Christ? And many of you would testify, I would not even be alive. I would have destroyed my very physical life. And we have opportunity to come in this place on the Lord's day to say, you are the king, you are the redeemer, you are the rescuer, and I love you. Amen. Amen. I'll say more about that in just a minute. Well, that's our first point, our, uh, this abuse of the law, this misunderstanding of the law. Second of all, I want to talk about here what is the Sabbath. Or what day is it? And I just want to encourage you here because 
uh, there had been those down through the histories, entire churches and entire denominations for that matter, who would say that the, that the Sabbath is on Saturday. We would disagree with that based upon the scripture. That the, that the Sabbath for us, the Christian Sabbath, as we testified from the Westminster Larger Catechism, is on Sunday and not on Saturday. But, but I want to I share some things with you that I think are going to be a huge encouragement in this regard. We affirmed in our affirmation of faith that the day until the resurrection of Christ was Saturday. And then at the resurrection, it was changed to Sunday. Now, why is that? Well, the first and main reason, the big reason is, is that the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead as the big stamp of verification and approval upon all of his work, including his atonement, was his resurrection, and that resurrection took place on Sunday. That's the big reason. But I want to note for you nine other things that happen on the Lord's Day. Now, we wouldn't normally catch this unless you're reading through the New Testament and saying, I want to look at every time that the Lord's Day, the phrase, the Lord's Day is used. But I'm going to do this for you very quickly. And because there's so many, I'm just going to blow through them. You with me? Hang with me just here a minute. Um, <clears throat> ten profound events that take place on the first day of the week. Number one, obviously, that Jesus rose from the dead. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, now after the Sabbath on the first day of the week began... The Marys came, found the, tent, the, the tomb that was empty, and we say, hallelujah. And that empty tomb represents so much for us. Second of all, in John chapter 20, the Lord Jesus comes on the Lord's day and appears to his disciples for the first time, and he bestows peace on them. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, the scripture goes out of its way to say this is the first day of the week when this happened. Thirdly, he also broke bread with them. First time he ate with the disciples, he did so on the Lord's day. Not just in that upper room in John chapter 20, but also with those two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. Number four, the fourth thing that happened on the Lord's day. He opened the understanding of the uh, uh, disciples that they might understand. And again, this was on the road to Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened their hearts to the truth, as he basically preached Christ from the Old Testament as they walked along. Fifthly, John chapter 20, again, uh, on the Lord's day, that the Lord first commissioned his disciples to the task of reaching the world with the gospel. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. First time there was this commission, in fact, to take the gospel to the world, came on the Lord's day. Sixthly, it was on this day, the Lord's day, that the, that the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples the Holy Spirit. He not only breathed peace on them, but in John 20, verse 22, it said that he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Seventhly, on the first day of the week... Um, it was the Holy Spirit who descended on believers generally at Pentecost. What does Pentecost mean? Essentially, it means 50 or 50 days after the Passover. The Passover is the day before the Lord's Day, uh, that, uh, that first time. And 50 days later, on the Lord's Day, the Holy Spirit fell in general at the day of Pentecost. A significant event in the life of the church. Eighthly, in Acts chapter 20, and this is verse 7, in Acts chapter 20, the Holy Spirit leads Paul to preach on the first day of the week. Now, here's what's significant. If you'll go to Acts chapter 20 sometime, you'll see that he had been in Troas for seven days. He could have chosen to preach on Saturday. He could have chosen to preach on the former Sabbath. He could have chosen to preach on Monday or Wednesday or whatever, but he chose to preach on the first day of the week. On Sunday. Ninthly, the first day of the week was the day that the collection of offerings was made in uh, Corinth at 1 Corinthians, as recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. And then finally, tenthly, it was on the first day of the week that the Lord Jesus Christ revealed the contents of the book of Revelation to the Apostle John. On the first day of the week, this is Revelation 1.10. Um, where these things are revealed to him. 
You think the first day of the week is significant for us? It is, in fact, the Christian Sabbath. All right, here's point number three. So how do we celebrate the Lord's Day? I'm not going to give you a, a, a list of what to do and what not to do. Um, but I simply want to say this. Do we celebrate it with this fastidious commitment to the keeping of the law with our hearts disconnected from all that God is and all that he has done for us, especially in the resurrection of Christ? Of course not. I hope that's abhorrent to us. That we would come and we would have this fastidious commitment to the law and our hearts be disconnected from God. God hates that. God hates that. But what he wants for us is lives that in fact honor God, that honor him and testify to the fact that he graciously chose us. Is that where your heart is on the Lord's day? But it's, but it's as we pursue the honor of God and we testify to the fact that we are his gracious choice. Don't you think that the defining characteristic of our participation in Lord's Day activities is joy? I think there's biblical evidence for this. In Matthew chapter 28 verse 9, after the, the, the two ladies have come to the empty tomb... And they leave there and they're going to tell the disciples, of course, the Lord Jesus comes and he appears to them. And he says this, his first words out of his mouth are, rejoice. It's Cairo in the original language. Some translations will translate it greetings, but it means rejoice. Now you might say, well, pastor, of course the Lord Jesus is going to say on the day that he was resurrected to the very first people to whom he would appear, rejoice. Of course he's going to say that. Well, in saying that, my friends, are you saying that the Lord Jesus said, hey, rejoice today and the rest of your life, the rest of history until I come again, feel free to be any way you want to on the Lord's day? I don't think so. I think, in fact, he's saying rejoice and keep on rejoicing. And especially on this, the Lord's day, on the first day of the week, rejoice. And doesn't that say a lot to us about the way that we worship? Now, I, some of you, as I get to watch you, I sit here and I'm looking out. And I say, these people got joy. They, these folk believe what they're hearing, believe what they're saying, believe what they're seeing. And there's joy that's in their face. Some of you, not so much. <laughs> Think about it this way. Think about somebody who would come to Mount Calvary and has, has never been in corporate worship before. Knows nothing about the Lord Jesus and they're looking around. And they get to look at you. <laughs> oh, that person looks like they've got some place that they need to go. Or no, that person is like, whoa. And I look at some of you and it's like, whoa, you really believe this. This not only has changed your life, it's changing your life right now. You, to look at your face and you say, you believe Jesus is actually here. <laughs> You're actually giving yourself to him right now. And this worship and joy is that thing that does, in fact, characterize you as you are seeking to worship him and walk with him. In Acts chapter 2, at the, end of the, at the end of the chapter, you know there's a list of things that the early church was doing. That they were sharing in the apostles' doctrine, they were breaking bread and all those kind of things. But there's an interesting phrase that's used that, that provokes us to faith and good works. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, 42, it says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They continued 
steadfastly, continued steadfastly. That's the phrase I want you to hear. The Greek scholars would tell us that there is not a single way to state that more strongly. There are no words in Greek, that wonderful language that can really get down to it. There's no way that that can be stated more strongly. They continued and they did so steadfastly. They couldn't say it any more strongly. And what's the Bible saying but that the early church was saying, This is amazing. Jesus Christ is who he said he was. He, he died an atoning death and he paid for my sins and he is raised from the dead and he, he lives, he's there at the right hand of the Father and we continue to work and we continue to labor and we continue in this truth but we continue in sharing the gospel. These were happy Christians. These were joyful Christians and other people wanted to be with them. Imagine people come to Mount Calvary and they look around and say, I don't know about hanging with these people. Where's the, where's the, they don't look like they believe in this. And what happened in Acts chapter 2 verse 47, five verses after the, the one I just read you. And the Lord added to their number daily. People saw this and said, this is real. God has, in fact, done something in their lives. It has to be said, my brothers and sisters, you're not really celebrating Sunday at all if you're not enjoying it. You know, you, if you don't enjoy singing, something's wrong. You say, well, I'm not a very good singer. That doesn't matter. If you... It's really a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know, I have, to, I have to mention this. How many of us have ever heard David Sanders sing? Go ahead and get your hand up. Now, he's just singing to the Lord. I thought about all the, every time I came across this point thinking about it this week, I just said, you know, he just ripped the lid off the can of joy and just said, we're going to get on with the joy. Singing to the glory of God. We're not really celebrating Sunday at all if we're not enjoying it. Do you enjoy preaching? Do you enjoy being taught the word of God? Do you, do you enjoy coming together? Do you enjoy the people of God? First John says that's a, that is, in fact, an indication that you're really converted. We're all different. We're all quirky. But the, the work of God in your life creates in us to say, I just love these people. These are my people. Yeah, they're different. They're quirky. Some of them are hard to get along with, but they're mine. And I love them. One more point. I need to finish up quickly here. Look at verse 13 in John chapter 5, verse 13. But the one who was healed did not know who it was who, who had done the healing. Didn't know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. This man didn't know. He was ignorant of who Jesus was. <clears throat> but he's had his life radically changed and he doesn't know by whom. And nor does he know the character of the one who has healed him. But you know what, my friends? I think that this may reflect some of the people in the world today. Maybe even somebody here. You may be here and you, you have no idea that Jesus Christ actually existed or you, or you don't know his character. Now, let me say to you, first of all, I'm so glad that you're here today, or those who are listening online. I'm so glad that you're listening online as well. But the Lord Jesus, he died. He died on a Roman cross. And then God raised him from the dead, and he ever lives. He's still alive and, and is at the right hand of the Father now, and one day he'll come back. One day he's coming back. 
But the fearful thing is, is that you don't know, just like this man didn't know, when Jesus wove through all those people and came right to the man who had suffered for 38 years, you don't know that he's the one who could heal your greatest problems. Now that's kind of scary. And you need to know that, that Jesus Christ is the God-man, fully man but fully God and has the ability not just to heal diseases, but to forgive your sins, to, to forgive them before, as God. You need to know that. That's what this passage is ultimately about. Do you see when Jesus finally tracks him down and finds him in the temple there in verse 14, he said to him, see, you have been made well. The issue is not your ability to walk or not walk or this 38-year affliction here. The issue is, look what it says in verse 14, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. In other words, he's saying the thing that is most important is that your sins be forgiven. And my friends, the way that sin is forgiven is that we come to the Lord Jesus and we say, I am a sinner. I take full responsibility for that. I don't rename it. I don't blame it on somebody else. But I have sinned. And Lord Jesus, I'm crying out to you. I acknowledge you as the one who can forgive me. The one who has purchased salvation through this atoning death on, on the cross. That's what he did. And I receive that. I, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to save my soul. And what does Jesus do in the face of this man's ignorance? He tells him that he must respond to the grace of God in his life by repenting of his sins, lest something worse happen. That's what has to happen. And what is something worse? It, it's when Jesus comes back, and he is, he's coming in judgment. He's coming in judgment, the judgment of our sins. And so the way we prepare for that is, is we stand in Jesus. We receive him. We stand covered in his blood, his blood applied to us, that atoning blood that pays for our sins so that as God looks at us, we are declared righteous. And that happens as we, we turn from our sins and receive Jesus Christ. And my friends... That's Jesus' biggest point in this whole scene at Bethesda. As big as the healing was, as it, can you imagine how incredible that would be? His, the thing that was largest in his mind was that the gospel be communicated to this, uh, to this man and all those who would hear it and all of you who would hear it through the record of Holy Scripture. Jesus is the one who heals organic diseases and he saves souls. Do you believe that? My friends, you'll have to if you're going to endure the judgment. Otherwise, the judgment for you will go very badly. Oh, come to Jesus. Come to the one who, who is the author of joy and joyful living. Because he brings the forgiveness of sins. Come to the one who heals those horrendous diseases. But come to the one who brings salvation to you. We all need it. We all need it. We will not have it except through him. Come to Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. God, you're so good. We thank you for your great provision. Open our hearts to this truth. Um, and Father, I pray for any of my friends here today who may not know you. I pray that you would give them the gift of faith. That you would open their hearts. That you would bring conviction, but that you would bring life and ultimate rest in King Jesus. We love you so much, Father, and praise you for your wonderful provision of Jesus Christ and salvation through him. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, Jesus, I am resting, resting as we close.
we can help you to know the Lord Jesus, if we can take you to his word, please do that, that you might know him in a saving way. Now go forth with the blessing of God and work out your own salvation and fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.